weird thing. Welcome back, everybody. We have an attorney with us today. Always love talk, talking to attorneys because we get to learn so much. The attorney that we're interviewing today is somebody for dual purpose. So his name is Matthew Long. Matthew has his own practice and you're in kind of somewhat Northern California, right, Matthew? Yeah, Los Bispo, um, referred to as the Central Coast. So yes. Half Yes, but like every attorney and every mediator wa works statewide. So now that we're into the Zoom culture, uh, we all can work everywhere. So Matthew works everywhere, but that's where he's at if you want in-person appointments with him. The other reason why Matthew is on is because we both belong to a community called the Amicable Divorce Network. And this is an exciting Still kind of new approach to divorce. Uh, people are now using the words, Matthew, I don't know if you know this, amicable is now a search word online for people looking for services in divorce. So we've come a long way, baby, on this. But a woman, a, a, an attorney named Tracy Ann Moore Grant out of Athens, Georgia, was a litigator for a million years, like Matthew, and then decided there just has to be a different way. Destroying families is no fun. And so Tracy Ann Moore Grants uh, went to straight mediation. Her firm will pick up litigation if need be. She will not do it. And she tried to establish this network of like-minded family law professionals around the country to join her in this effort. Matthew has joined her in this effort, as have I. So you will find us both on the Amicable Divorce Network California component. So I wanted to say both of those things. Matthew, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, now it's going to be your turn to talk. Okay. You do three things. You do mediate, and you mediate... Well, you do mediate. We'll get to how you do it in a second. You work in the area of collaborative law, and you're going to explain what that is in a second. And you, I think, I didn't get this from the website, but I think if people just came to you to file for them because they needed the comfort of an attorney to do that, you would also file, but it would be out of court, correct? Nobody goes to court when you file. Correct. Yes. Well, so we, we can follow up on that if you wish. Well, uh, go ahead and expand on that. Now you take it from here. Yeah, uh, I uh, help people get through the logistics, uh, among other things. Sometimes they already have an agreement. They don't need me to assist them with mediation. They just need to get through the, the issues. But they also maybe have enough complication where they've got a lot of questions. They're not sure how it's done. Um, you know, real property needs to be divided or something like that, but they know what they want. In which case, I will walk them through it. I will uh, help draft the marital settlement agreement that addresses those complications, but um, won't go to court with them anymore. Uh, we'll just document the agreement and help them flesh it out. Well, this leads to a question that I had uh, as I was organizing myself for this interview, and that is, because you're committed to not litigate, will you file for both people? I will, uh, yes, but I don't file in with my name across the top. Ah. Uh. Their name, uh, I will essentially draft the documents for them, but they are representing themselves. Now, when I say representing themselves, as far as their interaction with the court goes, that's true. But in terms of, you know, them understanding the case, them understanding um, what they want to do, they're, they're not alone in that. Okay. Well, first, I'm going to ask you to do one little technical thing, if you don't mind. Can you lower the volume a little bit? It's mm -hmm. resonating. And I didn't hear it when we were talking before I hit play or tape. Okay. Okay, thanks. okay, so 
in a scenario where we have very amicable, uh, we have a very amicable couple, they have no issue communicating, nobody hates one another, they're just getting divorced because it's time to move on, and they're very clear about what they want, do you, how does legal advice enter that scenario? Well, essentially, I do uh, much like what I will do in mediation, but uh, I give them what I think of as legal education uh, to the extent they want it to. I mean, they may already they, they may have decided they don't need that, that they know what they want. It's all very clear. Um, some things I feel uh, duty bound, uh, you know, if they're agreeing to do something that's quite very quite off of what a court would do, I feel duty bound to educate them on that. Let this not what a court would do, but you're allowed to do whatever you want. And then, and, I, and, and then is I, that important just in case after the divorce is final, something may come up that would address a decision they made that would be outside of how a court would rule just so they kind of know the framework, the boundary lines that they're extending for themselves? Uh, yeah, I think the, the, the terminology we like to use is informed consent. And that's true for pretty much each, each of the different processes uh, at various levels. We want them to be informed when, when they consent. They want it to be an informed consent, uh, a knowledgeable consent. I'm doing something different or unusual, perhaps. Um, and per, absolutely true if there might be an enforcement problem down the, the road or an issue that might erupt down the road. Part of informed consent is helping them to realize what how that may play out. Okay, that's terrific. Because interestingly enough, when I talk to attorneys turn mediator, and really just do mediation. Not every attorney agrees with me when I ask, well, shouldn't, shouldn't parties um, have legal advice or understand the law before they come into mediation so that they can understand when they're going beyond certain boundaries that they're allowed to go beyond or ask for certain things that may be well over what a norm would be in family law? So I'm really happy to hear you talk about informed consent. Yeah, thank you for uh, highlighting that because there is a um, different, reasonable minds differ on this issue. Uh, and so it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, the reason that some mediators don't want to give legal, ed legal education None of us should be giving legal advice, so I should come back around and and define that in a minute. But um, uh, the the reason they don't want to give legal education is because of the fear that it will narrow that that one or the other parties will say, "Well, this is how it has to be because that's what the law provides," and that narrows down the options. And very often, the reason uh, the law provides for certain things is somewhat arbitrary. And so uh, there is a group of mediators who think, no, we're not going to give uh, legal education because we want the parties to consider the broadest possible list of outcomes as they decide how to, how to do it. Um, I personally believe that inevitably people want to know what the law provides. They're going to figure it out one way or another. They might as well know that up front. Uh, oftentimes, the law doesn't necessarily clearly answer the question. Uh, so I don't, you know, I point that out. I point the ambiguities out so that people know that, uh, you know, you can't, decide, oh, well, I'm going to take this thing to court because that's what I'd get anyway. You, you, you uh, Far too often, you don't know what you're going to get. But at least you know the standard. At least you know what the question is. At least you know how it would fit together. And I think people want to know that. Legal advice looks like me saying, I think you should do this. That's legal advice. Uh, legal advice looks like and I think if you went to court, 
here's what the court would do mm -hmm. uh, unless that is unambiguous. There are certain rules that, you know, if the court is asked this, they're required, you know, this question, they're required to answer it that way. There's just no, amb there's just no ambiguity there. Um, surprising how rare that is. But that would be an example of uh, legal advice of saying, you know, the judge is going to do this, or the judge is going to do that, or you should do this, or you should do that. Yes. Education is, here's the rule. Here's the information you might want to assemble in order to, you know, answer the question. And you can do whatever you want. Here are three options that, you know, you could enter into to answer this particular question. Excellent. I appreciate that you said that because all too often, so there's me in my position. So everybody knows I'm not an attorney, a paralegal with an additional license to be able to file forms, document preparation company. Um, you know, not all things, and I know where my lines are, but I'm able to file for people who represent themselves, people that are, are not having an attorney and their names go on all the forms. Like you said, your name doesn't go on the form. And then as a mediator, I want everybody to get legal education without me. I want them to go somewhere else. I want them to learn and then I can work with them with the comfort level the, of knowing they are informed, now I can dig in and help with creative problem solving because we're speaking the same language, hopefully. And that's how I kind of look at it. I need to speak the same language as my clients. I can keep up with you. You know, I can see where you want to create your own unique settlement. That's fine with me. I have no skin in the game. You can create whatever settlement you want. You have no skin in the game. As a, as a mediator, you are there to facilitate the discussion and put the logistics to it. That's the other thing. So they do broad strokes because that's all they know how to do. But then there's those logistics like here's a common one. Okay, so I'm going to keep the house. And at some point, I'll pay you out, but you're going to leave title now, although you're still on the mortgage. They don't understand the logistics of, oh, no, you're really setting yourselves up for a little bit of harm, especially the one that stays on the mortgage but is leaving the title, thinking they're doing a good service to the other person, right? It's all done with good intent. So how about you? It's those logistics that are so important when you're helping them with the decisions they're making. Right. And so part of my uh, work, particularly as a media, well, you know, in, in pretty much every role that I play, part of my work is to say, you can agree to this and there are implications there, there, you know, and hear what those implications are and you can soften those with or clarify those in the language of the agreement or you know you can do something else but that has its implications too and that's uh the the what you've described is is kind of a classic um yes. you know so clearly you know if you're and i and i like to and i imagine you were in this position it's maybe skirts the line of legal advice. I guess you could decide where you are going to draw that line. But uh, I, I think it, I, I don't mind saying if you uh, are, do not plan to buy another house in the next couple of years, maybe you don't care if you're on the, on the prior mortgage. But if you, when you're ready to buy another house, you, you know, you may care. Some lenders are going to care about it. Other lenders don't care about it, but we don't know how to predict that. Um, there was a time when nobody cared. They'd give a loan to anybody. <laughs> yes, we, we do remember those times. We remember yes, those we do. Days. And they appear to be long gone. So, <laughs> uh, so different lenders have different uh, criteria. Are you on the loan? Is it spelled out in the judgment that uh the other party is absolutely responsible for uh the payments on the loan and you are not then uh some some lenders are comforted by that others not um i'm noticing that 
there is an you know a bit of an issue in my universe there shouldn't be but some judges uh, might ask the question well if you didn't spell out the, the what happens either at a certain time then you have to be taken off the loan or if they start missing payments you have to be taken off the loan what's going to be the remedy at some point when you want to be taken off the loan what's going to happen there some judges say well if you didn't spell it out then i'm not going to help you other judges are well of course you've got a problem here we're going to remedy that problem we're, we're going to force the person to refi or force the prop person to sell the property and get you off the loan so, you know, that's something you want to think about. Do I want to trust a judge on that? No, I think I want to spell it out in the agreement. Here's what we're going to do. Okay. And I get just a little bit more morbid than you do in this regard. And I say, look, we never know when we're going to pass away. So if you leave title and you're still on the loan and your spouse is living in the house and passes away, do you realize that you are responsible? This isn't family law. This is basic real estate. Anybody who's purchased a house knows this, or anybody who's sold a house or sold a couple knows this. And that is, you're still responsible to pay for that house. You don't have the asset anymore. You took your name off the title. I mean, that's devastating. And most people say, oh, thank you. I, I didn't know that. It's just, you know, you only learn this through doing. And uh, one person I met in, in my 12 years that said, I don't care. So, okay, fine. I don't care. Here, I'll write it up the way you want it. It's your divorce. It's your life. Can only do so much for people. Okay, let's move on to collaborative. Mm -hmm. So explain collaborative, please. Yeah, collaborative is a little bit like mediation in that the goal is to settle the case and a very high level of commitment to settle the case. It's not at all like mediation in the sense that there is no neutral party who is facilitating the conversation. Each client has their own attorney representing that person's interests, but those attorneys have entered into a contract, in fact, a stipulation that's filed with the court that says they may not take this case to court should it need to go to court, should it not settle. So we now know that the parties and the attorneys are highly motivated to settle the case. Oftentimes in the negotiations when there are attorneys, there, you know, it is it is at least implied or somebody thinks, well, you're only doing that because you want to cause trouble because you want to earn more money by having it go to court. Well, in collaborative, we know that's not the case. We've taken that off the table. We've also taken off the threats of going to court, taken those off the table as just not being helpful in getting us across the finish line. So, Collaborative divorce uh, values not just we've settled the case, but we've settled the case in a way that allows the parties to, to feel good about how they behaved, to feel good about their, you know, perhaps, not always, we, the goal is that they might feel good about the relationship further on down the road, as you can imagine, very important when they're kids. But you've got two attorneys who are representing the client in real time in a room together. They're not writing letters. They're not getting on the phone and jawing back and forth. It's like mediation in the sense that all of the negotiation is happening together as a team. The minimum team are two attorneys and two clients. However, most uh people who are doing collaborative practice these days see the value in expanding that team to include a coach, to include a financial uh, a planner, certified. Yeah. Yeah. Who is a, uh, who's going to handle the finances. So one of the things about collaborative is you see that team happening and most people start getting frightened about how much, how much it costs. 
So you wouldn't use collaborative on a simple non, you know, non-adversarial case. No kids, no house. No kids, no house. It's it's too much horsepower. There's more horsepower than you need to use collaborative. But the more complicated you get, and the more yeah, sticky wicket uh, of of the adversarial nature of the parties that you get, the more the value of having a team, um, helping this couple get through this thing in a clean way. Yeah. And, so the, yes, it is more expensive, but notice that you're now delegating all of the financial issues to the financial person, the person who is most qualified to have that conversation. Yes. Now you're, you're delegating all of the emotional and communication snafus and issues to the coaches where that's their arena. That's their, where they're best at. So we are not only doing some just delegating, but keeping everybody's uh, doing a better job of staying in their particular lane. Now, and anybody- even though it's expensive, I'm so sorry. I just want to make sure that people understand this. They are a little more in control of the money, even though it'll be a little more money because of what you said. There's no conversations behind the scenes between the two attorneys. For the most part, everything happens in front of everybody at the appointed meetings, correct? Correct. Yeah. And so there's a tremendous uh, value in preparing for those meetings and making sure those meetings are, are, are highly effective because they are expensive. But um, but that that effort is uh, plays itself out in in many different ways. So that the documentation is better, the preparation is better. The um, uh, you know we're not spinning round and round because at the end of every meeting we're doing minutes. We're making sure we've, uh, what we we know what we agreed to and what we didn't and that sort of thing. Right. But and and I'm always it's always important to me that the trust level is high between the client and the attorney. And so you know clients don't under parties don't understand how much work it takes just to write an email for anybody in family law you really parse words because voice context isn't part of an email or a letter and so you have to be very careful how you put language on paper so that it's not offensive people know where you're coming from it it just it takes more than people think. So I that's why I love collaborative. And you said it before, you wouldn't use collaborative, no kids, no house, you know, something very simple. But if you have a lot of assets and they're overlapping, maybe some are separate, maybe some are part separate, part community, others are community, or one spouse really has no clue what the investment portfolio looks like. They've never taken care of it. You know, this is where collaborative is great. And maybe a forensic accountant has to be thrown in there, too, to do some evaluation. But at the end of the day, it's worth it. Because to go to court and drag all of this out, it's even more expensive than collaborative, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, Yeah. And you brought up a good point about how it spins out of control when you're in litigation. Uh, You know, there's... Uh, uh, litigation attorneys love to pump out those eight page letters, you know, those eight page letters that, you know, are a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a pop that you didn't give you permission to write that letter. They just did it because they were going to say that's what their obligation is. Yeah. Uh, a, a, an eight page letter, which may feel good because it's so you know, poking at the other side, it it says all these nasty things, and yet at the end of the day, doesn't really move the ball down the 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 the, the playing field. You know, some lawyers are better than others at just throwing stuff up and not really worrying about it whether it actually advances the case or not. And in litigation, it 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 you lose control over it. Whereas in collaborative, you're at the table when the converse, when the real conversation, the bulk of the work takes place. Yes, you're at the table. The real stuff is happening. You're you're at the table. Yeah, 
I want to go into mediation and then I also want to talk about this coaching service that you offer, which I found unusually nice. But let's do mediation because you are a mediator as well and you do online mediation. How does that work for you? Are pros and cons of online? Pros and cons. Um well, the pros are there. It's convenient. Certainly, you don't have to get in the car and drive down to somebody's office. Um, so, and that turns out to be a big pro. Uh, a very, a very good. A pro and a con all built into one. Um, to some degree, the fact that you're not in the office together, your blood pressure doesn't go quite as high. Uh, so it's a little bit easier to not get triggered when you're looking at a screen than if you're sitting across the table from someone. Having said that, sitting across the table from someone, you get the vibe in the room a little clearer. You know, you get the body language a little bit better. You hear the sigh that happens, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that happens. Uh, and so, you know, the connectivity is reduced a little bit uh, and maybe to some degree a lot. Uh, and so that just raises the importance of, you know, easing into a meeting, um, making sure that you're asking people, you know, how are they doing or did you hear that or did, how, did you, how did you understand that? so that you're able to um, sort of make up for the nonverbal cues that you might otherwise have, have gotten had you been sitting together. Um, sometimes when there's a highly emotional meeting, it's, there's a, again, there's a pros and cons, but when there's a highly emotional subject, meeting in person uh, might be worth it. Um, I've had cases in which for what, whatever reason this case just needs to settle and it needs to settle right now um I, you know in those situations you you would you would rather be in person yeah. um I, I you know i prefer I, I prefer to avoid at all costs anytime that you it has to settle and it has to settle right now but sometimes that happens uh, in which case you'd kind of like to have the in in person option um, but it doesn't come up very oh, often. Oh, to write things up, to, to get things on paper, get some signatures, or at least this is what we've decided. I'll write it up more specifically, but... You're right. But, yeah. You know, oh, shoot, you said something about the value of doing online other than time. You don't have to drive to somebody's office. Oh, it takes some of the edge off of the fear, the energy that fear and anxiety drive when you're sitting in the same room with somebody. I get that. Um, you know, a little thing that I do when it's in office and, and I do like in office and my suite is large enough that I can put people in different rooms if I need to do a little breakout and do one-on-one -on -one just to to get somebody to calm down and share what they're probably not sharing because they're afraid to, they're afraid of the the blowback. But here's something that I like to do. Um, I seat the parties in the conference room and it's a small conference room. It's intimate. Mm -hmm. So I seat the parties there. And then um, there are a couple of things generally that I have forgotten to bring in, like the phone, which is my timepiece. And I will listen to them talk. It's an opportunity for me to see what their communication is like. Mm -hmm especially if it's the first mediation, where are they connecting? If they have kids, are they talking about the kids? So there's their commonality. If they can talk calmly about the kids, great. If there's no kids and they were supposed to get some uh, real estate numbers on the house they're going to sell, maybe they're exchanging that information. I like to see where the good conversation is so I can zone in and start there. So we can start on a positive note. Mm -hmm. That's how I kind of use an office. I wanted to ask you, is there a situation where you would stop a mediation because you felt it was going to be unproductive or you saw it being in your 
estimation unproductive. Yeah, when somebody is so triggered that they can't track the conversation in a in a in a uh, positive way, that's quickly becomes unproductive. Um, can't take in the information. I spend some time trying to diffuse that. Um, increasingly, I am going right at it and asking curious questions and, you know, diffusing it with a little more depth. Um, but the, um, uh, the other thing I have sometimes done is said, well, let's park that topic and then pick up a topic that is just educate that is just educational that I know they can get through. We can talk about this topic and be used profitable use this time profitably without it going off the rails. But it does depend on how far off the rails it's gotten. You know, when they've taken to yelling at each other, you know, a brief spat's fine. But if it becomes chronic, then I say, well, let's let's bring this to a close. I, I allow people to emote. I, I mean, I, I value allowing people to emote. And I also value a safe space. And sometimes you don't get both. <laughs> so yeah. you know, we have to find a, find a line there where, where emoting has become unsafe. Um, yes. And, and at times... I mean, there's so many different reasons for that, but one of them would be, and, and you had mentioned this when I spoke to you uh, a week or two ago, and that is one spouse isn't really clear about the financial picture of the family and needs to be educated, therefore feels a power imbalance. Mm -hmm. But I don't know anything. How do I even know what to put on the disclosures? How do I know what to talk? And you said that, in in the previous conversation we had, one of your perfect clients would be if you were working one on one with somebody, it would be somebody that just needs the support of a legal person because they feel they feel like the the less powerful in 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 the relationship. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I I like to think of it in terms of the power of no. I feel powerless, but I can assert the power that I do have by saying no until I have enough information. Not no in the sense of, well, screw you, but no, not yet. Mm. I would like to be able to say yes to your offer, but I can't yet because I don't know enough. So it's not a no, it's a not yet. I and like that. Can exercise that, that power and I can help the other person to know that it is in their interest to share information, to help educate, because that's the power, that's the pathway towards a yes. If you want a yes, you got to give the information that's going to help the non-educated person to know, okay, I feel comfortable. I'm ready. I'm ready to say yes. You know, I love that you said that because I, I do have a couple. We're finishing up now. I mediated for them and I'm filing for them. Uh, and one of the two parties said exactly that. Just this is a great offer you're making me. And I want you to know this is a great offer. But I don't know enough to say yes. I, I need to do some research. And I respected that. Smart. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just pondering here. I haven't really thought it through, but I'm, uh, I mean, uh, there are other ways to, as, to, to assert uh, power, but it all comes down to knowledge is power. Be, you yes. know, ed educating yourself on the process, education yourself on the law, educating yourself on what you own. And educating yourself on what you own may not be easy, but again, that's where, you know, you, you say, no, I'm not ready to say yes until I see, you know, this document or that document or um, when we purchase this property is important. And I'm not clear about when that is. So I need to see the deed. Um, okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. 
the last thing I wanted to talk about was the uh, unique thing, uh, super unique thing uh, in your services, and that is performance coaching. Ah, yes. Explain what that is. That really caught my eye, Matthew. Well, um, I originally became ed, uh, trained as a coach uh, a couple of years ago. It's been three, three or four years ago now, uh, I think. Partly because I was really appreciating getting coached myself. Um, and there was a skill set that was involved with coaching that it was a skill set that I wanted to have just in my personal life. But I was also aware that that skill set would support me in mediation, ability to ask curious questions, the ability to, you know, uh, reflect back what, what I hear in a way that people can understand. Um, so I got trained. It has helped me definitely in my mediation practice. Um, but I also enjoy, it is, it is somewhat uh, separate, although often ends up being part of uh, the family law uh, divorce world. But um, because I, you know, na as you can imagine, I naturally have clients come to me who, you know, oh, I understand you do divorce uh, coaching. Well, I do coaching and I know a lot about divorce. So <laughs> when I call it performance coaching, I'm really saying inviting people to think about all of the areas of their life in which they have something they want to get past or get better at or move forward on and have seen themselves challenged in doing that. And that could be a divorce. I, I'm not filing or I don't know how to file or I'm 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 not sure who I should who I should hire, what process I should use or whatever. Mm. But also be, you know, I'm thinking about changing my careers or I'm really unhappy with my career. I don't know what where to go from here. I find myself uh, un, you know, bored and unsatisfied with everything. Um, those are all uh, examples of I'm not satisfied where I am. I want to get to somewhere else and I'm not sure how to get there. And I need support in getting there. So performance coaching, coaching for many people uh, in the way that I've been trained, doesn't involve me, you know, telling somebody what to do. It involves me helping to get really clear about their questions, really clear about where they want to go, really clear about what it means to arrive there. So what are the criteria that you're going to use uh, to say that I achieved my goal or my uh, aspiration? Uh, and then uh, we, you know, I typically... Um, have people sign on for a 12-week period. They set up some goals somewhere they want to be 12 weeks from now. And week by week, they take steps to achieve those goals. And they look at the things that are getting in the way of them getting there. And we ask, and I help to ask them, you know, what what's the meaning you attach to that? What's, you know, what's working, what's not? a variety of different techniques to help them take those baby steps. And a big piece of that, it, it, at least, and, and very true in my own coaching, is how often, well, I didn't do the thing I said I was going to do. I'm a failure. And so can we re-educate people to look at that and say, I didn't get to do the thing I meant to do. I now have an opportunity to learn you know, what stood in my way? What was the attitude? What, you know, was I committed? How, what does commitment mean? Um, and now we, we really want to shift it from a, uh, I'm wh whacking myself because I didn't get the thing or I'm not achieving my goals to how do I learn? How do I step, take step-by-step -step uh, 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 movement to get there? You know where I see this um, being enormously valuable? I love everything you said, by the way. That was great. I see this being enormously valuable in divorce with the party that hasn't worked for a while. Yes. Whether yes. it's a short-term marriage or a long-term marriage, even in short-term marriages, the supplies for some, the other spouse makes a ton of money. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the pressure to earn your own living 
is not as high. And then if you have a child, if you started having, you know, started a family, if the pressure isn't there for both spouses to work because the money is there from one spouse, um, the spouse, then the other spouse will then tend to the children. But unfortunately, there is a divorce. So it almost doesn't matter how long they've been out of the marketplace. Even a few years in this day and age is an eternity, you know, from when we were kids, you know, the, everything is so fast tracked. And these poor people need help getting back in the game or thinking that the little business that they ran, which was their little side service business, so to speak, um, good enough for when you're married, holy heck, when spousal support runs out, short-term marriage, there's not a lot of years you're going to get spousal. What am I going to do if in a few years that spousal is gone and I'm not making any more money? Your coaching is invaluable in a situation like that. Yeah, it's easy for a person in that situation to be looking at all the reasons they can't do the thing, get the new job, get the education, whatever that may be. So part of the challenge is to helping them want it. You know, how can we how how can we develop a plan that is exciting, that where where they can see the you know the 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 upside, the uh, uh, the joy in it the empowerment in it. Um, that takes a while. <laughs> but It does, doesn't it? Even yeah. for us, <laughs> it takes a while. I just, I, I just, that's so unique, this, this service of yours within the other bouquet of services, you know, in family law. I think this fills a niche that's sorely needed. And I've not seen this on anybody else's portfolio of services. So um, good for you for that. Matthew, we've come to the end of our time. This has been so informative. I've loved listening to everything you've said. There will be show notes. We will um, give your contact information. But for those people who take notes while they're listening and want to write down how to reach you, how do they reach you? Best way is email. Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W at matthewjlong.com, M-A-T-T-H-E-W-J-L-O-N-G.com. Um, if you want to set up an initial consultation, go into my, the website, matthewjlong.com, you know, traditional click, click here for an appointment. So that's an easy way to set that up. Phone call, area code 805-254-4878. Say it again. Uh, area code 805-254-4878. Excellent. Um, but I do say that, you know, shooting me an email, most people are, have email or online uh, that uh, that that will um, I will respond to that at, you know, at 6 a.m. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> I won't do that on a phone call. So, uh, so absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Matthew, it's been great. I'm so happy I got to get to know you a little bit more and um, proud amicable divorce network folks here, but um, love your thinking, love your services. And um, thank you so much for giving us your time. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank and thank all of you for giving us your time. I appreciate every one of you. If you have any comments on this interview, you can write them to me. Uh, Judith at theamicabledivorceexpert.com. Judith at theamicabledivorceexpert.com. And as always, have an amicable day. <laughs>